Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I've really had a good time here so far. The people in all the sessions that I've done have been so um, wide awake uh, and so ready to receive and give something. I, I appreciate that, and I hope I can give something back in this talk today. Um, I want to adjust a little bit so that you can hear me without me yelling. Is that good right there? Okay. The older I get, and God willing, I will get a lot older, the more I see life as a string of pearls. These bright moments that for some reason stand out, still radiating something that I needed to learn at one time, and I find myself returning to them over and over again. Do you know what I mean? Do you have your own string of pearls? Yeah, we all do. Back in the 1980s, I watched a short interview that impressed me so deeply, I can still see it in my mind's eye. This was before the fall of apartheid in South Africa, and it was an exchange student from that country who'd been placed in a high school in Washington, D.C. The interviewer asked him what differences stood out. I do not understand something about this country, he said. Here you have everything that people in my country are fighting and dying for, that your own great heroes fought and died for, everything. But you don't use it. Thirty years later, this image still rings out for me like today's headlines. I want to give you a preview of what I intend to say in this talk. I'm going to make the argument that we in this country have everything we need to catalyze and nourish a society grounded in the values of equity, empathy, and belonging, but not enough of us use it. I will suggest some reasons why this is true. I will offer an antidote that might surprise you, but one you can use right away, because as strange as it sounds, that antidote starts with art. So stick with me, and uh, I think we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions and, and discussion, and also um, if we adjourn and you still want to talk, come get me, and I'll talk with you. First, though, let's take a breath to acknowledge where we stand. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. In what is now Oklahoma, we are standing on the ancestral lands of the Wajaje, in English, Osage Nation, Wichita and affiliated tribes, the Numana, in English, Comanche Nation, and much later, home of the Cherokee Nation, brought here on the Trail of Tears. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Please. Take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us all together here today. That acknowledgement is from a guide called Honor Native Land that the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture that Molly mentioned has authored. And if you go to usdac.us, you can download that free guide and figure out how to do your own acknowledgements in the place where you live and work. I also want to acknowledge another truth that often isn't spoken. This conference is taking place in the shadow of the county jail, just one of the elements of Oklahoma's prison industrial complex within striking distance of where we are right now. Why does this matter? Because while the United States as a whole has the world's largest prison population and the highest incarceration rate on the planet, Oklahoma has the highest incarceration rate in the United States, far higher than the national average. 
This isn't because Oklahomans commit the most crimes. 14 other states have higher homicide rates, for instance. 50 other cities have higher crime rates in Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma City is the highest in the state. Authoritative estimates say that incarceration here has risen by 700% since the late 70s, while crime during that time has risen by no more than 20%. So why do the law-abiding people of Oklahoma top the charts on incarceration? This is not unique to your state. Oklahoma, like many other states, has invited private prison entrepreneurs who import inmates from elsewhere to fill their coffers. Within the state's prisons, as in other parts of the country, we see how incarceration is used disproportionately to punish people who lack social power people of color, women, often for crimes that police, prosecutors, judge, judges, and juries see as undisturbing of punishment when committed by white men. Oklahoma's black population is under 10%, but a full 25% of its prisoners are black. Oklahoma imprisons people 80% longer than the national average for drug and property crimes. It imprisons women at the nation's highest rate, 91% higher than the national average. Criminal justice is the third largest category in the state's budget. If I were standing in Alabama or California, I'd give those numbers and they would be just as appalling. I fear for our country that the role we are now playing as incarceration nation our national willingness to spend our commonwealth on punishment rather than prevention will distort our spirit and bring us low. Every American is only a few degrees of separation from this system, knowing someone in prison, someone who works in the courts or jails, who works for a law firm or prosecutor, who supplies prisons, who works as a guard or a clerk. Every one of us pays for this with our taxes. Most of us here today struggle to win support for arts work that engages people, that lifts them up, that connects them. But perhaps we don't always think hard enough about where the money is going. There are three questions that I often ask myself, recognizing that we answer them through our collective actions, such as how we spend our commonwealth. Who are we as a people? What do we stand for? How do we want to be remembered as the planet's greatest punishers or its most creative healers? I ask you to keep those questions in mind. In 2010, I wrote a catalog essay for an exhibit by the San Francisco Bay Area artist Beth Grossman. In it, she offered a dozen different versions of the Golden Rule, the universal antidote to cruelty from disparate world regions. She could have offered twice as many, since this truth is encoded in the DNA of every spiritual and moral system. I like best the way Rabbi Hillel put it a couple of thousand years ago, do not unto others that which is hateful to yourself. Whether you find it corny or naive, or profound, the simple truth is this. If we were to treat ourselves and others with the same care typically seen in people who value their own well-being, we would cease murdering each other, poisoning the air and water, objectifying those different from ourselves, and countless other commonplace behaviors that lead many people to despair of the future. I wrote in that essay, the golden rule governs the creation of community and also the creation of art. Its realization requires the two skills that make both possible, imagination and empathy. To apply the golden rule, we must be able to put ourselves in the other's place and to imagine how a sensibility very different from our own might perceive the actions we are about to take. The precondition is awareness of our own feelings. How else are we to know what might be pleasing or hateful to ourselves? And that awareness must be matched with the ability to imagine the other's feelings 
as if they were our own. As described in the Shinto text, Beth Grossman has chosen for one of her dozen. The heart of the person before you is a mirror. See there, your own form. Regardless of your cultural heritage or faith, and I consider atheism equally a faith as it's conditioned on believing in something that's absolutely unknowable, everyone here has been instructed in the core principle of human relationship. Two kids get into an argument on the playground and one escalates the conflict beyond words, hitting or kicking the other child. What does the teacher say? How would you like it if Jackie did that to you? A golden rule. No one can say how many laws exist in the United States, but there are definitely millions because I Googled it. <laughs> Sometimes I fantasize that if we actually obeyed the golden rule, we could have a one-line universal public policy. As everyone knows, policymakers sometimes prescribe measures for others that they would find intolerable in their own lives, such as installing families in degraded or dangerous public housing, or consigning children to substandard and neglected school, or incarcerating children for their parents' perceived transgressions, such as crossing the border illegally. Imagine what would happen if we changed just one thing. If we begin to require policymakers and their families to live by the strictures they impose on others. Imagine if their families were required to attend public schools, to live in public housing, to use public health facilities, and if they crossed the line to be just as vulnerable to punishment as the poorest and least powerful among us. Think about the guy in the White House right now. How would that change his life? We have a double standard. All of us know that if we actually treated other persons as equal in value to ourselves, offering the same care and comfort we desire, suffering would be greatly reduced and the quality of life greatly improved. But from long experience, we mostly find it preposterous to expect that even the people entrusted with the well-being of the body politic will be guided by this understanding. Let's bring it down to the level of the individual human being. Each of us has unlimited supplies, access to unlimited supplies of the resources most critical to the future of life on Earth and in every community. Imagination, understanding, empathy, compassion, and action. As scientists learn more about human cognitive apparatus, they keep discovering ways that empathy is rooted in our brains and bodies. For instance, they've identified an empathy gene, a receptor for the hormone oxytocin, which promotes social interaction and the ability to enter into the bonds of friendship and love. It's made in the hypothal uh, hypothalamus and released through the pituitary gland. It's critical to the relationship between mother and infant, and it's also been shown in controlled studies to increase people's openness to those different from themselves, those who are not part of the same family or in-group. It lessens anxiety, fear, and pain, and increases trust and generosity, and every one of us has the oxytocin receptor in our own brains. Scientists have also found mirror neurons in the human brain. When we observe something or imagine ourselves feeling or enacting something, the nerve impulses that fire in our brains are almost identical to if we had actually done the action ourselves. Mm -hmm. Athletes commonly train this way. When they can't be on the field, they watch videos of past performances. There's considerable evidence that this aspect of our brains supports understanding and empathy. So empathy is part of our operating system, the basic mental and emotional software that comes with every human brain and body. No external force can put a break on our ability to cultivate imagination, both personal and social, nor on our capacity to achieve understanding, nor to manifest empathy and compassion through a commitment to universal belonging, to equal rights and equal treatment for all. 
So the question I ask myself over and over is what stops us from living by the golden rule, from manifesting empathy, from pursuing equity, from enabling everyone to belong? And for me, it comes down to this. Two obstacles stand in the way of a social order of empathy, equity, and belonging. And both of them can be defeated in each of us by self-awareness, will, and especially persistence. The first is what the late great Brazilian educator Paulo Freire calls internalization of the oppressor. This means taking into ourselves the voice of those who benefit from the subjugation of others, mistaking that disempowering voice for the voice of truth, and unconsciously allowing ourselves to serve that voice through our fear, passivity, and pliancy. The second is the imprint made on our behavior by eons of conditioning, making us prey to impulses that may have once served survival or valid social goals, but that now imperil us. How do we experience internalization of the oppressor? Sometimes that's an easy question with hard answers. The voice says, dial back your dreams, you haven't got what it takes, leave the big stuff to your betters. The voice says, let the powerful speak for you, they know more, more and you know nothing. After long repetition, the voice can start to sound like your own and what it says can start to seem as self-evident as the sky is blue, two and two make four. Generations of girls have taken into themselves a belief that they should downsize their ambitions to fit the dimensions dictated by men in power. An alarmingly large proportion of young people and people of color have taken into themselves the belief that they have no place, no power in the political process. Even when it comes to something so basic as valuing our own bodies, two generations of black is beautiful have been so far needed to begin to undo the self-loathing white supremacists have worked so hard to install in human operating systems. How do you tell when internaliz internalization of the oppressor is acting on you? That is a simple answer. You ask Cicero's ancient question in Latin, qui bono, who benefits? And if the answer isn't, the people who are commonly made to feel like objects acted upon, rather than subjects, actors in their own history, if their answer isn't the people lacking a fair share of power and participation, then you can be sure that your brain has been carrying water for forces who wish to make use of you for their own gain. How do we experience the other obstacle to liberation? The impulses and attitudes resident in the deep structures of our minds. All humans have these basic impulses and responses that have been imprinted by evolution and reinforced by custom. Um, our early ancestors had a hard life out on the savanna, learning to take shelter from storms and evade predators. As a result, our brains became really skilled at recognizing danger. When our ancestors saw a distant shape moving toward them, they ran to escape or they flung rocks to drive off peril. In your brain and mine, the amygdala, a little almond-shaped uh, body at the base of your skull, is the seat of this type of reactivity, racing to conclusions without taking time to consider. Today, those same reflexes distort our social relationships. For many people, fear rises at the mere sight of a young man in a hoodie, approaching from a distance. People are pulled over, or reported, or arrested for the crime of driving, or drinking coffee, or standing while black. Knowing this, the consultants and spin doctors who advise many political campaigns prey on fear using images and code words that may not be evident to everyone but speak clearly to those who know the code. This is what they call dog whistle politics. This is all reactivity at work, plain and simple. But amazingly, 
our big brains also possess the conscious power of the forebrain, the neocortex, enabling us to notice, to observe ourselves, and to see when such urges no longer serve or when they are being exploited by fear mongers and to adjust our behavior accordingly. With a little practice, reactivity always, always, always yields to awareness. The hitch is, awareness runs on will. We have to want it. How can that desire be kindled? Because it does need to be kindled. Human beings possess hardwired, brain-based capacities and time-honored cultural operating principles that, if all of us just use them, could make our world a far less frightening and far more loving and just place. But having these capacities doesn't mean we'll use them. Most people's bodies come equipped with everything we need to dance or sing, for instance, but quite a lot of us don't do either. Moving from the latent capacity to the practice of compassion, that has to be learned. And that is one critical place that art comes into a starring role. When I sit in a darkened theater, opening my mind and heart to stories very different from my own. The tears, the laughter or perplexity I feel set that learning in motion. The more opportunity I have to feel empathy for characters very different from myself, the more my potential understanding and compassion grow. And it isn't only theater, of course, that our hearts can just as easily open to a photograph, a song, a painting, a piece of writing. Consider one of the most common needs for compassion, facing loss. Folks losing their homes from superstorms along the Gulf Coast and Eastern Seaboard, fires in California, children losing their parents at the border, even legal immigrants being separated from their loved ones, women losing the feeling of safety that comes from being heated when they share their stories. I'm not gonna give you the whole list because that would use all the rest of my time and depress us too much to stand up. <laughs> but I do want to pose this question. In the face of loss, what can activate consolation and hearing? And I do want to offer a powerful answer, art. A couple of years ago, I interviewed Carol B. Bell. She's head of Ashe Cultural Arts Center in New Orleans. And this was part of my research for a publication called Art Became the Oxygen, an Artistic Response Guide, also free from the USDAC. It was created to help artists respond to natural and, uh, and civil disasters. I want to give you a snippet from Carol's experience after Hurricane Katrina, getting back into the city seven or eight weeks after the storm. She told me this. People needed something magical to help them feel better enough to face the next day. Every day was a reminder of irreversible loss. Probably most of us had never imagined what happened. People always talk about the perfect storm. There was a way in which, like death, you leave that out there as something that could happen, might happen. But when it happens to you, it kind of strips you of your security blanket because you know that it's real. So we had art as a healing force, music, the opportunity for people to be together and to find creative ways in which to interact. This became the work that they did at the Cultural Center in the weeks and months after Katrina. Carol said, there are so many things that anchor our existence. To lose them all leaves us on a sea without an anchor. So people were dealing with identity issues. They were dealing with disenfranchisement issues. They were dealing with homesickness. They were dealing with loss in a huge fashion. And what we really came to appreciate was the necessity to get some air in the room first before you try and do something else, to get them some oxygen so that they can start breathing. So art became the oxygen. In a time of loss, the main challenge is to kindle hope grounded in real possibility, a desire to move forward that can counter the pervasive message all around us to abandon hope, to retreat, or subside into passivity. What kills that desire to keep on 
is believing the voices that tell us that hope is futile, what Freire called internalization of the oppressor, as I mentioned just a few moments ago. The voices that tell you the future they want is the one you'll have to accept. I meet so many people these days who are afraid to live. They don't want to be hurt, and that makes them fearful of risking vulnerability. And without open hearts, we aren't living, just surviving. The suffering this entails is ironic, a self-fulfilling prophecy. People fear getting their hopes up because they don't want to be disappointed again. So they avoid risking hope. They pre-disappoint uh, themselves like someone who says, I'll never win the lottery. And when you ask, did you buy a ticket? Ah, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> we can't guarantee the future. But there is one certainty, which is that people who don't get their hopes up will never see their hopes realized. The opposite of fear is embrace. The antidote to those oppressive voices is to understand that the future is not yet written, the future is never written until it unfolds. And to entertain alternative visions of possibility rather than surrendering to doom. And I ask you, who in our society compounds alternative visions of possibility from a heady mix of social imagination and desire. Artists, of course. Think about the film Black Panther, released last winter, which brilliantly portrayed a mythic history to arouse hope and possibility for millions of theater goers. Think about the impact of unearthing and facing our own buried histories, as so many artists are now doing. Indigenous artists are focusing on their ancestors' resistance to whatever harmed the people, the cultures that helped them survive, the fact that they persisted and even thrived. The pattern applies to the survival of the Tibetan people in, in exile, in the work of public artist Lily Ye, developing the Genocide Memorial Park and the Rugarero Survivors Village in Rwanda in the generations descending from Africans brought to America on slave ships. Indeed, in the stories of every single people forced into exile. In times such as these, people predict the end of the world. The thing is, the same prediction has been made countless times, and always our collective challenge has been to live learning about our ancestors, learning about all the people who built our communities, not just the generals who led armies or the wealthy figures whose friends and admirers paid for monuments to establish their place in the great man theory of history. Accepting our past with all their triumphs and mistakes helps us to understand that as at all past times, the present offers choices that can shape our future and all of us are entitled to have a say in those choices. Recently, I wrote about two very different projects that share an objective that Free Egon Femi of Untold RVA in Richmond, Virginia has dubbed commemorative justice. Free's work includes initiatives such as the memorial altar built on the African ancestral burial ground site in Richmond's Shaco Bottom, honoring the anonymous ancestors buried in unmarked ground and the Stick and Move project using beautifully illustrated wheat paste posters to supplement or correct the historic record. Each poster features a number of passers-by context and then here, first-person stories of the previously unseen history right beneath their feet. What Untold RVA is all about, Free told me, is being able to combat the erasure of important narratives within the commemorative landscape. So the Remember 19 project is producing residencies by playwright, musicians, and other artists, aimed not only at creating an oral history-based drama connecting past and present, but at building local cultural infrastructure and capacity to continue that work far into the future. The past is always in dialogue with the present in such work. What can we draw from what was done to us? or what was done in our names.
that supports our resilience, dynamism, and power going forward. And I've been hearing um, about a, a hundred year project in Tulsa to commemorate the race riots and uh, integrate them into the curriculum. I'm, I'm gonna put these two projects in touch with each other. We need artists to provide the consolation that can sustain a vision of love and justice to come despite the losses we have experienced and afflicted, the losses we've survived, and those we can't anticipate. In an equitable society, everyone must be subject to the same questions. We can't have true equity when certain people's assertions and opinions are considered sacrosanct, while everybody else is expected to justify themselves. Right now, some questions really need to be asked because we are in danger of accepting ready-made answers that don't serve us. Flexibility is one of the human species' best qualities, allowing us to continuously adapt and advance. But it also works against us because we find it just as easy to adapt to what harms us, going along to get along until what has been imposed feels natural. So I ask you, who asks as many necessary questions as four-year-olds wondering why the sky is blue and what makes rainbows? And you know the answer. It's artists. <laughs> and just listen to us. What is actually happening here? How did things get like this? What would happen if I tried this? What will this word sound like next to that word? What will I get if I mix this color with that color? How close can I make this character to the politician who annoys me the most and still get away with it? <laughs> Questions open up cultural space to consider alternatives, to see possibilities rather than only impediments. The public artist Candy Chang, dealing with the impact of a loss in her own life, created an interactive participatory project called Before I Die. It's a question without a question mark. The sentence, Before I Die, with a blank, is stenciled onto the black painted wall of a building, an abandoned house in New Orleans. Anyone was invited to take chalk in hand and complete the sentence. It attracted so much interest that Chang created a how-to website which has to date catalyzed more than 4,000 before I die walls in 70 different countries. It's what they call a memento mori, reminding participants of the inevitability of death, but it's also a memento vivere, reminding us to live while we can. To have true equity, people must engage the question of what type of society we want, understanding that our answers actually matter. I'm moved by the thought experiment of the philosopher John Rawls. He counsels judging a good society from what he calls the original position, which is imagining designing a social order without knowing what gender, orientation, cultural identity, race, religion, wealth, position, or other circumstances I would occupy, you would occupy within that society. Not knowing where I stand in the social order, I would advocate the social arrangements that guaranteed the best possible living conditions and circumstances at the lowest end of the scale, the scale of power and privilege. Wouldn't we all, not knowing what position we occupy, prescribe a social order that follows the golden rule, refusing to prescribe for others conditions that would be hateful to ourselves? One of the intense challenges of this moment is that fewer and fewer of society's winners actually consider this question, and there's not much pressure on them to do it. Instead of imagining themselves in the place of the least powerful and therefore investing their creativity and resources in improving those people's lot, Instead of knowing what most of the rest of us know, which is that whether you are born into fabulous wealth or poverty has more to do with luck of the draw than personal virtue, they believe their luck is a reward that can never be withdrawn. 
The football coach, Barry Switzer, described such people as having been born on third base and going through life thinking they hit a triple. So many artists now are trying to get not only those who are blind to suffering, but absolutely everyone to face the most important questions, very often employing the path of empathy. The women who are telling and writing and singing and enacting their stories as part of the vast movement called Me Too are using their gifts to invite people very different from themselves into their own direct experience to feel what they have felt in the hope of inspiring empathy and healing action. The question of our moment as people try to be heard across boundaries of class race, religion, orientation, gender. That's a simple question. Can you see yourself in this picture? Can you imagine what it is to be me? For any hope of a livable future, the answer has to be yes. And we artists have a lot of work ahead, nourishing imaginative empathy, demonstrating equity from a place of love, embracing true belonging. James Baldwin famously said, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions which have been hidden by the answers. Artists play a phenomenally important role, questioning, exposing the assumptions that uphold all that is damaging in our society, and now more than ever, we need our questions. So that brings me to belonging, the third in the sequence. I've heard it said that belonging sounds kind of soft, but to me, it's a knife that cuts straight to the heart of our collective challenge. How do we cultivate a society that embodies the right to belong, that offers justice and love, equity and compassion, the right to see and be seen, the right to feel safe in one's school, to belong? Decades ago, I taught a graduate course to students from many different art departments to help them explore and understand their own cultural identities before delving into the question of others. I asked them, What's a real American? Are you one? Almost no one said yes. Some were immigrants, some were people of color, sexual minorities, artists of any heritage and identity who live into many artists' characteristic doubleness in the society but not of it, to paraphrase Stevie Wonder. Somewhere along the way they received the information that full belonging was not to be theirs. <coughs> To name the condition of belonging without barrier, I use the phrase cultural citizenship, always being careful to say it doesn't have anything to do with legal status, passports, uh, voting rights. Because even using the word citizenship reminds people of the many ways that immigrants and refugees have been stigmatized and excluded in this country. But I'm really not inclined to surrender contested words to those who use them as clubs to beat others into disbelonging. Democracy, art, culture, citizenship, these are fundamental human rights that should be universal. In a condition of true cultural citizenship, everyone feels at home in their own communities. All heritages are honored for their contributions to the collective culture. Differences embraced as a source of richness and wisdom. And wanting to know each other takes the place of fearing the other. So how do we know when disbelonging is engaged? Here's an example. In so many US cities, newcomers and developers with deep pockets drive out local people needing affordable places to live and work. Zoning and economic development initiatives that privilege profit over people often make things worse. Artists are sometimes used as a leading wedge, the ones who are willing to repurpose disused industrial space to live without the usual amenities. And so they come to others to symbolize the problem rather than the solution. Organizers are drawing attention across the country to this growing displacement, rallying people to protect long-standing communities. This is placekeeping 
a word I prefer to place making, which unfortunately implies a blank slate. But we have to take care that the desire to limit economic depredation and prevent displacement is not converted into an assertion of special belonging. The people who've lived somewhere for generations must be recognized for all they've contributed to social fabric and community. This seems so essential to me that part of my work as chief policy wonk as the USDAC has been to propose a cultural policy initiative requiring authorities to conduct a cultural impact study. This is directly analogous to an environmental impact study to determine and to ameliorate the potential negative impact on cultural fabric of things like rezoning, redevelopment, and tearing down neighborhoods to construct new sports stadiums or freeways. It's amazing that we can stop this kind of destruction in our cities because there's an endangered insect or plant, something I'm in favor of, but human cultural fabric has no comparable standing in law or policy. You can download that platform also from the USDAC site. It's called Standing for Cultural Democracy, the USDAC's policy and action platform. So wanting to, to uh, protect placekeeping, that's important. But it doesn't mean that the right to belong doesn't apply to newcomers. Those whose ancestors have been driven away from another place by baseless hatred or, or who were pushed out of a home place by economic necessity, they must also belong. Or we risk an endless chain of people who suffered from the violation of their rights inflicting the same suffering on others. The opposite of the golden rule. <coughs> we live in a society in which the fullness of cultural citizenship is denied even to most people who possess legal papers uh, entitling them to vote and travel. How many Americans long to see their communities portrayed on television as something other than criminals and degenerates? How many students are offered a version of history that consigns their own heritage to a footnote? How many are denied the right to culture through fundamental acts of expression and association, walking or driving while black, dancing together in a nightclub, visiting with friends while waiting for public transit? So I ask one final time, who envisions and portrays full cultural citizenship? Who has the gifts to express belonging big enough to encompass everyone? the family that just arrived, and the family whose ancestors have lived on this land for countless generations? And again, you know the answer, artists. Consider Project Row Houses in Houston's Third Ward. Under the leadership of public artist Rick Lowe, over the last 25 years, beginning with a row of these rundown shotgun shacks built in the 1930s, the project has acquired 40 properties used for artist residencies, exhibits, classes and workshops, but there's also a residential program for young mothers, an incubator for creative uh, enterprises, an economic development council, a lot of things that express the fact that everyone belongs. Consider the Great Wall of Los Angeles, the flagship pro project of SPARC, the Social and Public Arts Resource Center in Venice, California, founded by public artist Judy Baca. Begun in 1974, this half mile long mural depicts the history of ethnic peoples of California from prehistoric times through the 1950s, and they're raising money to extend the timeline. People see their own histories, this is commemorative justice, valorized in this massive site of public memory from the Chumash practical and spiritual life of a thousand years ago through the arrival of the Spanish, Chinese immigration, the Great Depression, World War II, Japanese internment, ships carrying Jewish refugees being denied entry at the port of LA, the rise of rock and roll, and much more. Consider those dedicated to building a loving and just society, few music. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of working with Community Music Works. You should Google it. It's a great project in Providence, Rhode Island, founded by members of a string quartet with a rich performing and commissioning life. 
They offer free music lessons and much, much more to the children of the stress neighborhood in which the group is based. They engaged me to take part in and to document, to write a publication about uh, a symposium called Music and Civil Society. Participants came from music organizations around the globe. Many were inspired by and worked directly with Elsa Stema, this enormous Venezuelan program that has become a model for music education in the US and beyond. Most people connected with Elsa Stema repeat the point that although many musicians emerge from its programs, they are not in the business of making musicians, but of making citizens. In immersing students deeply in the musical community they construct with daily lessons, a fabric of social inclusion, and an atmosphere that's truly rigorous and yet permeated by love. They seamlessly join pleasure and purpose, accomplishment and play, individual excellence, and community building. If you want to see how this translates in the US context, look up My Cincinnati, um, which is directed by Eddie Kwan, or Play on Philly, which is directed by Stanford Thompson. So I've offered you three steps toward bringing about the transformations that the society so desperately needs. From indifference to empathy, from privilege and deprivation to equity, from exclusion to belonging. They start in your own heart and mind and lead you outward. The first step is to examine your own values and beliefs, distinguishing those that benefit exploiters and oppressors from those that increase the world's stock of love, beauty, meaning, and freedom. Every one of you has this power. Open the eyes of your heart to discover how you've internalized harmful messages, then use your powerful awareness to eject these invaders, returning to your deepest truths. The second is to learn to be aware of your own reactivity and to help others do likewise. With practice, we can notice when primitive fear takes over, fear that doesn't serve us, our survival, but in fact undermines it. We all have the power of our conscious minds to see when we are in the grip of reactivity and to practice replacing compulsion with choice. Abraham Joshua Heschel said that in a free society, few are guilty, but all are responsible. The third step is to recognize that truth and put it to use to nurture a social order of justice tempered by love those are the words of James Lawson, who uh, written into the founding statement of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. How do we do this? Some of us might run for office or organize demonstrations, drive people to the polls, or write letters to elected officials, and all of that is part of the exercise of the, our responsibility. But what I mean and what I've tried to talk to you about today is using the special capacities we have as artists and people who engage and support the work of artists. I started this talk about that, with that story about the young man, the exchange student from South Africa, who marveled at the freedoms past generations in this country fought and died for, and the fact that we often don't make use of them. The skills and qualities of the engaged artists are precisely what the world needs now to set things right. Improvisation, imagination, resourcefulness, empathy, communication, connectivity. We need to ensure that we use them to the fullest. So I ask you again, who are we as a people? What do we stand for? How do we want to be remembered? as the planet's greatest punishers or its most creative healers. And I hope you'll take away this qu these three questions as to how you can use your gift to spread the asking. Thank you. Thank you.